Hello, welcome to VR Roundtable, episode 85. My name is Gary and joining me is Steve and Chris. Uh, Anthony isn't able to join us this week, but he'll be back next week, I'm sure. Um, so we're going to be talking about VR for the next hour and a half or so. And uh, yeah, I guess we can go over it. Steve, what have you been up to this past week? Have you got anything to tell us? I haven't been up to anything special. Um, did, nothing did you at all. See, sorry, sorry, just... Did you see the royal wedding? Because that's all that's going on over here at the moment. So I was going to ask you, being our, our resident uh, Englander, I don't is that the right way to say it? I don't know. resident person in UK, if uh, you if that you were completely enthralled and, and just completely overcome and and distracted by the the magnificence of this royal wedding. Absolutely, yeah, I was in tears all morning <laughs> to be honest. And um, now the problem. My daughter was absolutely crazy on it. So she actually went swimming to a swimming class this morning. So I actually had to record the build up. We recorded the build up to the royal wedding so she could watch it when she came she came home. Um, but yeah, no, it's very sort of uh, to me, it's a little bit boring, but uh, she loved it anyway. And uh, at least all the countries getting involved in it. And you've, we've got we've got you Americans coming over here, corrupting our royal family with your, your American charms anyway. So. <laughs> really? Like, uh, I think I think I saw that George Clooney was there. It's really about all I've seen is just blurps and headlines. Because, uh, yeah, yeah I, I care that much. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, and it, what have you been and it doesn't have anything to do with with your country either because if it was some sort of royal wedding in my country i'd feel the same way i'm like if it's not people in my family or my friends <laughs> i don't really care i'm not going to get yeah. all wild up over a stranger me me too but yeah it's been a bit, quite a big deal over here anyway chris how about you yeah i mean i know my grandmother watched it like 4 a.m but that's all i know so far <laughs> um <laughs> Man, I've been doing this interesting project that didn't work out, but I was trying to get my mom's 2010 Prius to self-drive, but it didn't work. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> So uh, is, it, is it still functioning as a normal car? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> didn't break it. Yeah. Good stuff. I can see all your skateboards in the background as well, Chris. You've got, you're have got getting quite a collection there now. <laughs> a little bit like my guitars. I've got my guitars there. You've got your skateboards in the background. <laughs> and I have like three or four downstairs oh my <laughs> god it's too many <laughs> okay um well we should probably get onto the vr stuff now anyway and we want to start off on games this week because um we've got sort of a, a bit of a preview on red matter which is being released next week on the 24th of may i believe and um, so one we've had sort of a hands-on on that um we can talk about the first section of red matter and want to get into that this week first so Red Matter, um, it's available for pre-order at the moment, and there is a small discount on the pre-order, but the usual t uh, price is £24.99 over here in the UK and $29.99 over in the US. It's developed by Vertical Robot, and it's sort of like a, uh, a puzzle adventure kind of game, and we saw some trailers of this last week or the week before, I believe, and it looked pretty interesting, very reminiscent of some other games that I can point to, possibly something like The Gallery. It's very reminiscent of that kind of stuff. Um, and I've played through the first section. I'll get into my thoughts in a second. Chris, I'll go over to you first. I know you've played through the first section as well. What did you think? Yeah, honestly, like I was impressed because I didn't really know anything going into it. Like, even though I'd seen the trailer, it doesn't really tell that much about what's going to be like in VR. But like, man, once you get over this first ledge and see like this alien planet, it's really immersive. Like, I was, it was, I was really surprised how good everything looked and how polished like the devs really made the experience so there's like a couple mechanics you have the the translator which you can point at signs and stuff and translate them into english which i thought was a cool touch um you can have like a flashlight on your hand as well and then the teleport system is kind of interesting you kind of like float because there's low gravity on the planet i thought it was pretty cool like it was pretty innovative it's not just a normal teleport system it was kind of like you use your thrusters to the thrust forward um but yeah, I, I thought it was just really immersive and definitely there's like a story behind all this that I don't think any of us have really gotten to yet because, you know, we can't talk about that or anything. But uh, so far what I've played, like there's a lot of lore, which I like. I scanned like all these objects and it's it's just really cool to kind of get that. And it also has like really good audio design. Um, I, I know, Gary, you'll talk about that, too. But like it's really eerie, really weird. It's like this war that went on that's still, I guess, going on and you're trying to infiltrate this underground base type thing. Uh, but yeah, overall, like I was really impressed not knowing much going into it. It kind of reminds me of like Portal 2. It's a little bit of like Fallout in the beginning section 
too. I don't know. Like, I'm really impressed just because it was made for VR rather than like adapted. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve, um, I know you've played it too. What did you think? I thought it was pretty good. Um, you know, in terms of a game, I would say the VR game it most reminds me of are the gallery games, gallery episode one, gallery episode two, uh, mostly because it is a, a interactivity, you know, interact with your environment, solve puzzles. Um, uh, to, to this point that I played, I've not met any like NPCs or had any interactions. Uh, I've not had any combat. I've not had any uh, explosions, guns, n- none of that. So it's it's mostly an interact with your environment, solve puzzles, go there, complete your objective. Um, from a, from a backdrop, you you appear to be a spy. Um, really, you're like this astronaut spy, like if Lance Armstrong was to join MI6 or something. Um, and, and, and I do want to talk about the the locomotion because it, it's kind of a big deal. Um, initially, when when we got it uh, available to us, it was teleport only, and and you have to think like as an astronaut. At first, it was kind of um, jarring. I didn't really like the teleport. It was slow, and I, I, but once I used it a little bit, I I started to like it. Um, and I keep saying astronaut because if you think of of the footage you know that we have of, of the astronauts on the moon you know when they jump they did these slow sort of long jumps and and, and that's what it's like you know you're kind of just thrusting over to your to you, where you've chosen to teleport to and while you're teleporting you can look around you as opposed to be a a fade to dark and then bring back you know sort of a blink teleportation um that we've seen in a lot of other games so once i played around with it for a little bit i i, I started to like the teleport somewhat um but since i played it and i haven't had a ch- chance to check it out because just yesterday uh we're recording on saturday uh on friday tatiana um the the lead on the de- development of the game she emailed us all and said that hey the we have a due to demand already we have a uh smooth locomotion patch so gary i believe you've checked out the the smooth locomotion Oh, I have, yeah, yeah. So um, the smoother locomotion works in conjunction with the teleport. I still believe, I think you still need to use the teleport during certain sections of the game. Um, at least even during that first section that um, that we're, we're talking about, I think there's one point in, in particular where you probably do need to use the uh, the teleport. But the free roam locomotion, it works by squeezing the grip button on the Oculus Touch controller, and then you point the controller in the direction you want to go. It's very slow. Um, and I think, you know, this game has obviously been designed with that in mind. It's a very slow, methodical game. It's not an action game. It really is an adventure, and you really need to take your time and explore this world. Um, and that teleport, you know, I just want to touch on that teleport thing again, actually, because... One of the reasons developers tend to use teleport is to mitigate any sort of motion sickness um, that people might experience in these games. And it's interesting to me that they've gone for this sort of strange way of doing the teleport. I like it, actually. I quite like the teleport way. As you both described, you pick a spot and then you sort of fly over there and you can increase your speed. So you can fly over there a little bit quicker if you choose to do so. But it's still sort of a very slow movement. And... I just wonder, you know, people that are having motion sickness problems, is this really going to be helpful to them um, teleporting in this direction? Because there, there is still an artificial element of locomotion that's going on, even though you're not in direct control of it. Um, so I just wonder about that and why they've they've gone for that rather than something like a blink teleport. I mean, it makes sense in the context of the game and it, it w- describes how the teleport works in the context of the game. And I understand that. It just seems like counterintuitive that they've gone for this rather than a blink to mitigate motion sickness really well i think they they kind of wanted to wrap it in the the um not narrative but they want to wrap it in the in in the world a little bit i think it makes sense in the world and and they clearly you know wanted to figure out a way to do teleport their own way uh and and not make it be this immersion breaking that a lot of times people feel teleport is or at least that was my takeaway from it and, and why they kind of went down this different path path with it. Um, but, but again, I liked it. And some of the other things, uh, I think graphically the game looks really, really good. Um, there's, it, it runs really good on my machine. There were no frame hitches. This is a very polished, uh, very well put together, um, 
And some of the de- the developer has uh, some experience with a few games. Uh, the one that stood out to me was Spec Ops: The Line. Um, so this isn't a uh, an indie developer that 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 hasn't been around the block a little bit uh, in terms of making games, and that really shows here. This feels like a a a higher quality game. Um, with that said, like the 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 only caution, and I, I really shouldn't even call it a caution. Um, I really like this game. I'm going to keep playing it. Um, that's really no question there for, from my standpoint. Uh, but when I think about the VR community landscape, uh, there are some people I think that just want nonstop action. They want you know a game like Robo Recall or Onward or uh, some Pavlov, something like that. And I'm while this game could shift directions and we haven't seen it yet, um, I think this is definitely a slower play pace adventure game. Um, you know, um, it feels a little bit from the very, very little bit I played of abduction. It feels very similar to that. Um, of course, you know, mentioning abduction, you can bring up mist from, from, from many decades ago. Um, and, and that's a, another likable, it's not point and click, but it is a slower paced, you know, figure out how to, to get out of this room or figure out how to, to go down to another level. Um, and, I think everything that I've seen is really well done in that sense, but it's not fast paced action. So um, yeah, it's, it's kind of the only thing I'll, I'll put out there because I think some people will want a game that is, is developed as smooth as this and looks as nice as this and, and has all the attention to detail, but may, might expect some action out of it just by the way it looks. Um, yeah. And, and again, I, think- I don't know that action isn't coming, you know, we might get to the l- later parts of the game and, you know, could be battling zombies or something for all we know, but it, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it's going to go that direction. It's possible. I mean, I, I also doubt it because because we've got this this section that we're able to talk about. I have literally only played that very first section because I didn't want to say anything out of turn um, in, in case, um, you know, obviously it can sometimes slip out. But with this, I mean, I really, really like this game. And I think I'm probably one of the most positive out of all of the people that have given first impressions on this game. I think um, actually my impressions are very, very positive. I really like this kind of game, especially with it being sort of sci-fi based and you're on this alien world. And what Chris was saying, you know, that first section where where you um, you're, you find yourself on this planet and the graphics are just incredible. Um, among the best graphics I've seen in a VR game. And it comes down to, you know, again, it's the textures and the lighting, especially are so good in this game. The reflections on certain objects as well is very, very good. And th- these are things that sort of pop out to me without even sort of trying to find the, the what makes these graphics look so good they just sort of pop out to me that they they really do make a difference um and as chris said you know the sound to me the sound is sort of very very understated but it's there it's always there in the background and it's excellent you know every part of this game just goes towards you feeling like the atmosphere that that you're on this alien world and you're exploring somewhere and we don't know exactly the story the story that's going on here but you're ex- exploring this abandoned base and there's been something that's happened where they've uh, sort of um, been evacuated from this base. And the thing that actually I really like about this game is the level of um, interaction, but also exploration in these, you know, with it's literally sort of 15, 20 minutes of gameplay that I've played so far of this. And it, there's so much little detail within every room and we've only explored a few rooms, but there's a lot of detail going on. And one thing like in a lot of these AAA games, I find that there's a problem with interaction where you see objects and in real life, you'd expect to just be able to pick these objects up and examine them. And you're not able to do that in a lot of games within this. It seems like you actually are, even if the objects don't really do anything, you're still able to pick them up and, and interact with them and scan them. As Chris said, you know, you can scan all these objects and it will tell you some, a little bit of information about it. If you're this kind of player, very methodical, very slow paced, I think this is the game for you. And I I think I I am that kind of player. I like having this slow, methodical narrative experience and just taking my time with it. I think it's great. And um, from what I've played so far, I can't wait to continue playing and speaking about it next week. Yeah, I think it really brings in the immersion, just like all this slow build up. Like you're like, wow, there's so much lore. Like I feel like I'm really here, which was really cool. I was just gonna touch on like the very few puzzles that we did experience so far. Like I think they were really well balanced. Like I never felt like I had to jump to YouTube to find out what I was had to do or whatever, which I couldn't have maybe anyway. Um, but yeah, like I felt like 
you know, I, it, I was stumped for a few minutes. I was like, man, what do I do? But then I'm like, oh, there it is. So I think in terms of like the difficulty of the puzzles, I think it was like spot on for, for a VR game. I don't know if you guys experienced right. that I was, too. I was going to talk about the puzzles too. You, you, you beat me to it. And they feel very well balanced. Like, you know, one of the games that stands out in my mind is Wilson's Heart. And 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 I really loved Wilson's Heart. Uh, but some of the puzzles, like you, you almost felt like you were cheated because you knew what to do. You knew what the solution to the puzzle was. In one specific example, um, you had to have a, a code to a lock. And like I found where the code was and I was like, okay, I know the code. I've seen it on this piece of in-game paper, uh, but it would never let me put in the code. And this is in Wilson's heart again. Um, and come to find out, I had to tear the corner of the page out of the notepad before the game would let me advance. This game doesn't seem like it has any of those, um, I'll say, quasi-broken mechanics. Like, I feel like if you solve the puzzle, the game knows it, and, in, in, you know, you're, you, you're not cheated, or you're not fighting a puzzle while also trying to f- fight uh, some line in the code that, that won't, let you, won't let you jump to the next to the next thing um so everything is is really done well in that and, and it feels completely fair uh, i've probably explained what i'm trying to say very poorly and i apologize for that but um yeah i, I think this is really really well done on the puzzle front. not I, I get you it's it's these little things where you you've, you've you know the puzzle you know the answer and yet you've got to do this this arbitrary thing just so the game knows that you know the answer to it i understand what you're saying and actually i think you're both right about the the puzzles within this game being well balanced and actually i think they that from what we've played the puzzles i mean there's only been a few puzzles that we've been able to play through but the ones that we have played through are very natural and 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 by natural i mean they don't feel like they've been forced in terms of the context of the game so for example i mean i'm sp- thinking specifically of one of the first puzzles you go into uh, when you enter the building um and it's to do with fuses um that that puzzle and i think that one is very well done it's not like you it, it's literally what you would do if you were in that situation where where would i find where would i find these things and it, it just comes to you far more natural than a lot of other puzzles in some other games, I think. I think they could have put layers in there to just make, justify those kinds of puzzles. With this one, it feels like a very natural puzzle. And I know it's sort of early on in the game, so the puzzles are relatively simple at this point. But I'm interested to see where they go and, and what they do with the puzzles, because so far I've been very impressed with those as well. Yep. Okay. Um, has anybody got anything else they want to mention on Red Matter before we move on? I don't think so, but should we say if, if we'd pick it up personally, maybe, like we go around? Yeah, yeah, I will. I think... I, I'd pick it up. I, I I recommend it. With the caveat, if you're an action only player, then then you know maybe tamper your expectations there. But for everyone else that can get into things that aren't explosion and nuclear heavy, um, yeah, I, I certainly recommend this game. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, same here. I I agree. So we all agree. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it, for the kind of games that I really enjoy, to me, it's a no-brainer. This would be definitely one that I'd pick up, yeah. Mm. Okay, so you can pick that up on uh, May the 24th anyway. Um, so let's get on to this n- new next one. So Skyworld. Now, this is a free weekend at the moment. When this show comes out, um, obviously, the free weekend will be ended. But um, it looks like there is a half-price sale going on until the 21st of May um, for $20. Um, so let's get into Skyworld. I, well, it looks like we've all played this game. So um, I could go over to Steve first on this one. What did you think? So I've, I've been uh, interested in Skyworld, but I haven't had a chance to, to give it a go, uh, mostly because I haven't bought it. Uh, I always have so many games to play, and and before I go out and spend my money on a game, you know, I kind of want to run through my backlog. Um, so I had a chance to play this, uh, being that it's the free weekend, and it, like I said, it's kind of been on my list of, of things to get to because I love, or I've started to love, these um strategy games in in vr uh it started with tethered on playstation vr and then most recently with um brass tactics which which we all really really like so um sky world is it's somewhere between that you know and i mentioned tethered and brass tactics for for a reason because for me sky world sits in between them um you you're kind of more responsible for the world for the for the map uh in in a similar sense that tethered is and, and that you have to um uh, build uh, buildings and, and manage resources. It's not just purely a battle um, game like like Brass Tactics. 
then as you progress and you engage with with enemies on the world uh the table comes out flips over does this pretty cool animation and now you're in battle mode and then you the game plays like a sort of stripped down um brass tactics in in the sense that the the combat you can't really traverse the map it's a much smaller table and you can only sort of point your 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 units in a certain direction uh and, and, and you deploy them via cards, which it has sort of an RPG element that before you get into battle, you can upgrade your cards and you can spend your resources like like magic and gold to, to upgrade your cards, to get your cards stronger before you go into battle. So this is a, a very multi-layered uh, strategy game, and I, I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, at $39.99, it might be a little overpriced i'd like to see it maybe 29.99 but um this is a very well polished very deep layered game i know i've only sort of scratched the the outer layer on it like i don't have the the time you know prior to us recording the show with the free weekend to really get deep deep nested into it and i'm sure there are people out there that have become uh experts of of all these individual mechanics but um it's I think it's really well put together and it can be as complex and as deep as you want, which is interesting because, you know, when we talked most recently on Brass Tactics, now a couple months down the road last week when we were talking about our top games so far of 2018, one of the things I think you said, Chris, or maybe it was you, Gary, you, you had mentioned that you kind of see Brass Tactics for the sim- simplicity that you kind of almost in a way wished you could go deeper with it or have a few more layers. And and although Sky World is different, I think it definitely has those elements of, of multiple layers that, that you could really dig into. Um, so from a value proposition at $29.99 or $39.99, if you're like really into these games, I think you can get a ton of mileage out of it. Yeah, yeah. Chris, um, I know you've spent a little bit of time with Skyworld as well. Again, you know, we're recording this show on a Saturday, so this free weekend has only really just started. Um, so we've not spent a huge amount of time with this game. But Chris, why don't you tell us what you think? Yeah, like I, I played way less than Steve, probably. I kind of got overwhelmed at all the systems. I'm like, man, if I had hours to sink into this, I feel like I'd really love it. You know, just like I've done with past tactics, like the more time I sunk into that, the more I liked it. I think it's the same with this. Um I mean, what I can touch on is I really like the customization because you can like put all these panels wherever you want them and it's really customizable in that sense. So you can really kind of make the game your own. So you're like, I'm going to have the end turn button over here. I'm going to have like my buildings over here. Um, So I I like that aspect of it, like how customizable that is and kind of how the menu system works and just overall the mechanic of like the table flipping over to reveal different things like you're inside your your town hall or whatever you're in battle mode like i i like that a lot so i definitely have to play it more but um i i think it's good like if you want more out of like some like brass tactics then this is probably the next best thing you know yeah yeah i um i played this for the first time early on today and you know, I, I, I just had half an hour spare, to be honest, and I came in into my office and I thought we were about to go out and I thought I've got half an hour free. So let's go in and just check out Skyworld. I didn't really think I, w- I would speak about it because I didn't think I put enough time into it. But um, actually, I, after five minutes, I was thinking I really don't want to get into this. It looks a little bit too complex to just get a, an idea of it, even over a weekend, to be honest. But I kept playing and I kept playing and I kept playing and I was actually late going going back um, because this just hooked me in after those first 10 minutes that were initially sort of pushing me away a little bit. And I think probably it was the point where, uh, Steve, you were talking about where you get to that first battle and the table flips over and then you're almost in like a brass tactics arena, as, as you said. Um, not quite as enjoyable as brass tactics, but it works in a very similar way and actually enjoyable. It doesn't last too long. Um, you can get these matches over with relatively quickly um at least during that first tutorial section anyway um and i really enjoyed that and from that point on i just wanted to keep playing and you start to learn these little systems as you would expect to do so in the this type of game and both of you guys i think i agree with you in terms of this being brass tactics with sort of extra layers layers of depth i I still prefer brass tactics for what that game does but it does it in a, a very it's it's 
not got quite so much scope as this game. This game is trying to do the brass tactics thing, but also do these these other things as well. Um, by having these extra layers of depth, I think it will be probably a more enjoyable, well, no, I shouldn't say more enjoyable, but equally enjoyable single player experience because you can really dive in and get to get get into all these little systems that are in place on this game. And that's, as I said before, you know, I think brass tactics, once you get to a certain point, it, it is sort of, missing out on those those layers of depth so i'm glad that this game has got it i'm actually going to continue playing this i'm very tempted to pick this up for the half price although i will agree with steve on his point i think 40 dollars for this is probably a little bit too high for what it offers um but for that 20 dollars, i think that's perfect this game is really really good and i wasn't expecting to like it um so yeah i, I encourage people if they haven't checked out over the free weekend check it out on oculus store and see what you think see if you think it's worth 20 dollars. i've liked every a strategy type game that I played in VR and and I've said it a thousand times I think probably on the show people are tired of hearing it but I wasn't a strategy fan game like a real time strategy top down god view uh, strategy game fan prior to VR and I think it has something to do with the presence and seeing all the little tiny soldiers and, and, and everything um, but I also maybe wonder if you guys with Brass Tactics sort of um, popped your cherry so to speak and now maybe these <laughs> RTS games are going to appeal to you more like maybe go back and give tethered a run uh yeah. you might like it now you know um because there's 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 something to it you know the same kind of charm i think that i found in lucky's tale is a totally different kind of game but but seeing this little miniaturized world around you there's there's just something about it that that grabs me and and, and sky world also does that um you know with with the combat like each battle that you're in is minor like like we keep comparing it to brass tactics and and I think it's very fair, but um, you know, brass tactics, the goal is the, the whole match all takes place on that big table. Whereas the match in sky world is that first sort of starting layer that you're in where you're managing resources and you have your kingdom, you're the king or whatever um, you, you, you have your kingdom and, and then there's enemy infiltrating it. And then each battle that you go to when the table flips into the battle, that would be more akin to just a couple of units fighting on the left side of the table in brass tactics, you know, yeah. cause there's, it's, 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 it's very, it's very layered like that. And, um, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think for 20 bucks, I'm very uh, close to pulling the trigger uh, on this game as well. I, I don't know when I'm going to play it, like, you know, because I'm still trying to get through Skyrim and Fallout and everything new that comes out, <laughs> you know, every week. Uh, but yeah. but I, I think I would like to have this in my library for when they're is maybe that we're ever going to get it a down period when, when we're, you know, scratching and searching for something to play. Yeah, the um, the one thing I'll say about it, just again, I guess comparing it to Brass Tactics is I do miss the fact that you're not able to, at least I don't, uh, when the short time I played it for, I wasn't able to, like in that first map section where you're building out, you're, you're placing these buildings to gain resources, I'd like to sort of zoom in, move over the map a little bit um, just to get closer to some of these things. And I don't think you're able to do that in the way that you are with Brass Tactics. You can literally just turn the table around so you can rotate this map around and view it from different angles. Um, it works okay, it's not a big deal, but I do sort of miss that kind of thing from Brass Tactics. Um, and you're right, Steve, you know, we probably shouldn't um, compare this too closely to Brass Tactics. It's a completely, uh, you know, in some ways a completely different game, um, but it just has those little echoes of Brass Tactics in certain areas, I think. Yep. Yeah, definitely. I feel like Brass Tactics, like you said, Steve, it's just like the intro to, to RTS and VR, and then suddenly you're like, wow, this is like a really good genre. I need to play all the RTS games now. So that's that's me, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, well, let's get on to this new thing that came out as well um, last week. So, Sensor Bounds, this is on uh, the Oculus Store. We just went, This is sort of a very, very basic little utility within um, the Oculus Store where you can download it and it will just show you the placement of your sensors within your room and show you if you've got any sort of blind spots or anything like that. So, um, yeah, Steve, why don't you talk about this a little bit? Okay, so you know, as I've talked over the last couple of weeks, I, I've relocated my my office and my VR play space in, into this room that I'm in now, and um, I, I got a fourth Rift sensor, and I, right as I was about to to sort of get it mounted on the wall and everything, um, this this app came out, and it's called Sensor Bound, and I did not write down who who uh, made it. Um, 
apologies for that. I'll try to remember to put it in the, in the, the description below. But um, this, is a, this is a neat little app. And it almost makes you wonder, like the, the very first thing that comes to mind is, is why wouldn't Oculus sort of have this as a utility built into it? Like when you click your menu to adjust volume or do anything you do in the, in the main menu, this should be just a, another button that you can click to bring up this view. Uh, but, but what it does is it, it'll show you a, a sort of a generic layout of, of your, your play space. Um, I, I'm assuming it, it takes it based on where you've drawn your guardian and makes it a nice straight edge. Uh, but, but like we've been able to in VR since the, the very early days of the Rift or the Vive, where you can see your base stations or your Rift sensors, um, you, you see them up in the corners of your room or wherever you've placed them. And they draw out the cone uh, of, of the view. Or actually, I should say it draws out the inverse of the cone. So it shows it, your dead spots. It doesn't show you your, your good spot. I, I guess it does by, by nature of showing you the, 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 the dead spot. You, you see where your good spots are. Uh, but it sort of shades in with these blue lines as sort of a, uh, of a hatching or a texture in a way of, of where your dead zone is. And, and when doing mine... Um, before I got the fourth sensor up, I have two sensors down on one end of the room and one sensor down on the other. And I could go to the corner that was occluded where I have the one sensor and literally cross my hand past the, the blue line showing where it got dead. And I would see immediate degradation with my touch controller. Like I immediately became occluded. So it seems to be really accurate and a very useful tool um, as you're setting it up to eliminate dead zones uh, i've already seen where i kind of quickly threw the three that i have up where i need to adjust their their angle pointing down to the floor a little bit um so I, I think in part i'm finding this incredibly useful just because it was very convenient timing with with what i had going on in relocating and resetting up my play space um for those that have kind of been rock solid for for a long time like like you gary and, and, and chris um it may not have an immediate value but if you ever start moving your stuff around or get a new room uh i think this this very free very cheap uh uh utility is, is very nice yeah i um i briefly tried it it's a very basic utility and you know i've got quite a small play space here and so <clears throat> It didn't really tell me anything I didn't already know. Um, I know where my dead spots are, but it did confirm them, I guess. So, you know, like you were saying, Steve, it is pretty accurate. Um, yeah, it's by um, a developer called H2K Studios, um, a very small download. In fact, there was a little bit of confusion with Chris and I. On the uh, download, it seems to say that it needs two gigabytes or something to download this app. It's not that. It's around 25 megabytes. I don't know why it comes up two gigabytes uh, for some reason on the Oculus Store. But um, yeah, if anybody's having any problems with uh, sort of tracking or anything like that with the Rift, then this is, this is a, a great app to get just to close down those little dead zones. Yep. Okay. Um, well, let's go on to, because I picked up an Oculus Go. So I've got an Oculus Go now, and I, we just wanted to have a very quick discussion, Steve and I. Steve's had one for a couple of weeks now. Um, and Chris, you've got a Gear VR, so you can probably, I don't know if you tried it, even any of these games on the Gear VR at all. <laughs> uh, but we do want to just go through a few of the games that we've been trying on the Oculus Go. Um, and actually, well, let me, I just want to start on Star Bear Taxi at on this because i tried this on the oculus rift and on the oculus go just to do a kind of a side-by-side -side comparison on these two um well before i go into any of the games let me just give a, a very brief impression just because a lot of things have already been said about the oculus go and i agree with pretty much what people are saying um on this so the oculus go is is fantastic for the price that it's going for it is incredible value the Optics are great. Um, the screen is great. The screen door is um, definitely lower, um, but it is still there slightly. And I think the, the 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 main thing with me on the Oculus Go is the fact that you've got lower screen door, but a lot of the apps will run at a possibly a slightly lower resolution overall. I don't know if you've seen this, Steve. And I guess it's a little bit difficult if you've been super sampling in the Rift anyway to, to do a direct comparison with this. But um, yeah, so this is a, a resolution, obviously slight resolution hits on some of these apps with the Oculus Go, but the screen door is lower. I mean, for what this thing is, I I, I couldn't be happy with, with uh, how it's ended up. 
initially when i first got it i did have a couple of problems um, i should probably go through this very quickly because when i got it i wasn't able to pair the controller the, the i downloaded the app everything was going fine and then when i got to the point where you have to pair the controller with the oculus go it, it paired it but then the app wouldn't progress any further and there was no way to really skip it within the app so i was left with something that i couldn't get past so i put the headset on and it would just tell me to refer to the app then Steve said, you can get past this. I tried it multiple times, by the way. I didn't just try this once. I did factory resets and this kind of stuff. Then Steve said he did see a post on Reddit where you can actually bypass the app setup. Um, so I found this post, uh, bypass the app setup. But by doing that, I think you cause problems elsewhere. Um, and nothing really worked correctly. Um, the the it wouldn't update the firmware on the headset or anything like this so i reset it numerous times i mean i must have done it at least 15 times factory resets going through it again and again and trying to get this to work eventually i bypassed the app and it was still connected to the wi-fi and it did a firmware update from that point on everything worked fine then um once it had got that firmware update everything was was great and the app functioned the way it should and the controller was fine so i just wanted to quickly mention that if anybody's having these problems and i know that some people are because i was on the oculus forums the oculus support forums and um, so some people are experiencing these small problems well, the um, the day that, that you were having these issues, uh, I went in a couple hours after you and I were chatting and, and I went to download Ken and it wouldn't download. And I, I was thought it was kind of, kind of odd uh, that you were having issues and I was having issues. So there was a day, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Wednesday night or Thursday night here in the States. It would have been even later for you, Gary, um, where you couldn't download on Rift or... Uh, go or basically all of oculus's servers you couldn't download content uh, you couldn't install any new apps so i almost wonder if if what you one of the things you were dealing with was just they were having issues on the server side on on, on oculus's side and, and maybe it couldn't register it or do whatever the app is doing uh to start pushing down the initial firmware update to you and and, and all that jazz so it could have been just on on them is, is yeah. really what i'm getting yeah. at yeah, well, I think on these uh, support uh, posts that I read, it was literally the day I got my Rift, uh, sorry, my Go, and the day before where people were having problems. So I, because I saw an update on the Oculus app a couple of days before that, so I thought maybe the app's at fault here or something like this. But yeah, it's entirely possible it's all related to the same thing. I'm not too sure. Anyway, the end result is it's fine now. Everything's working okay. Um, but just on this first game I want to talk about, so Star Bear Taxi, I've played this on Rift and on the Go, and they are very slightly different games. There's obviously like a mobile version for the Go, and the, the Rift version is uh, it's got a lot more to it. Um, not a lot more. There's just a little bit more meat in terms of the the environment and that kind of stuff. Both games work very similar, and I actually really really like this game. I know Steve, you mentioned this because um, a few weeks ago on the Rift. Um, well, is, is it on the I mentioned it so Anthony had played it on the Rift and I had played it on the Go. It was it was the the week um, the Oculus Go had come out. So, uh, did you play it with the Go controller or did you play it with the um, with a with the gamepad? I played it with the uh, Go controller um, and it works pretty well. I've got to say, it reminds me of a game I used to play a game um, <laughs> an old an older game on my Amiga. It was called UG and it was exactly the same thing i mean you're you're a caveman taxi in that game and you just have to um move your taxi around from ferrying people from different locations star bear taxi works in very similar ways to that and actually i really like this kind of game um on the go it's um i mean it's a great game obviously there's a slight graphical downgrade but it operates in pretty much exactly the same ways on the on the rift even with touch controllers there's obviously you've got sort of these very very fine movements that you can make on the touch controllers and i guess it makes a, diff a very slight difference in terms of the gameplay but it operates really really well on the oculus go um i don't know have you played it on the rift as well steve yet or just on the go no i haven't played it on the rift um but i know you're going to talk about some other games <laughs> that i that i have played on 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 both the rift and go yeah well let's go on to them why don't you uh pick a game and uh, talk about it well um the mo most recent that I played was Ken. Um, I, I downloaded this last night and um, started started to play it. I picked up a gamepad and it, it, I kind of slowed down on the go uh, uh, until a few days ago because I kept forgetting to to pick up a 
an Xbox One Bluetooth controller. So you need a, a Bluetooth gamepad to pair it with the Oculus Go. I don't know off the top of my head if you could uh, use a, a tethered, you know, to the if you had some sort of adapter where you could do micro USB to micro USB, it, it might work tethered. But most people are, are pairing with a Bluetooth controller uh, to play gamepad based games. And the the Go controller itself, like it's it's OK for for navigating the menu. I don't really like playing games. I don't like playing games with it. I, I, I don't know why it just hasn't really grab me and I don't like swiping on touch pads and, and and whatever so I knew that I wanted a, a gamepad so I finally got around to picking one up this week and um, I've, I've gone back and revisited Blaze Rush uh, I've started playing Ken and um, I'll start with Ken like it, it feels the same like I, I don't know Gary maybe you're paying attention to the nuances a little a little better than I am but with Ken like it felt because you played Ken on a Rift with a gamepad, so I'm literally playing it on the same type of control mechanism. And to me, Ken felt damn near identical, if not identical, to playing on the Rift. And um, I know it's not a very demanding, a very taxing game graphically. Uh, I know it's relatively simple. It's a very good platformer in, in, in the scope of what it's trying to accomplish. Um, but I had a big smile on my face in part because I really enjoy Ken, but also in part because I'm sitting here thinking like I enjoy playing Ken a, a few months ago on the Rift and now I can literally take this and play it in my car or I can, uh, I'm going on a trip next next Sunday, I'll be flying um, out of country and we'll see if I come back divorced. My, my I'm, I'm going to take my Oculus Go with me and I'm going to play or watch a movie while on the airplane. Um, public be damned. Anyways, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking like, wow, I could sit on this airplane next week and I could be playing Ken. Like, you know, and um, there's something exciting about that and, and that it translates to that to that experience I had on my Oculus Rift. Uh, but I don't have to be in this room. I don't have to be tethered by a cable i can just pick it up there's um just in general the oculus go well the, well the rift does this better than the vive I always with the vive you know it's always a you know getting into it but the um the steam vr software was never as for me and i know it can vary by people but it was never as smooth as, as oculus home um well, the Oculus Go is a, is, a, is an improvement over Oculus Home, and that I just pop it on, and boom, boom, within you know twenty seconds, not only have I got the headset on, but I'm in a game and playing it, and that that access, that that ease, uh, is something really nice. It really is benefited by by a game like Ken or Blaze Rush, where you can just go in and, and run through a couple little levels and then take it off, you know, because you got 10 minutes to spare here. Um, I can't come up here and play even a game like Beat Saber. I can't really justify getting set up and getting in the game uh, to only play for 10 minutes. You know, I, I, I want to commit 20 30 minutes, you know, sort of if I'm going to get in and, and do something in VR, the Oculus Go is the inverse of that. You know, if I got five minutes, like it's worth putting it on sometimes and just seeing something, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, sending it yeah. back to you. you. You've hit on a point there and, and we could stay on it for longer, but I think you've said it all really, you know, it's the, the lack of having to suit up and uh, put on coming. It's like for me going into my office, uh, turning on the PC, putting on the Rift. I want to spend a little bit of time with it then. I don't want to just do that for 10 minutes, whereas you can do that with Go, and I really like that aspect of it. Um, just talking about Kin and Blaze Rush um, is two examples of what I want to mention on this, is these are both examples of games where I enjoyed them. I really liked Kin um, playing it on my Rift. I just never played it, and it goes back to that thing. I wouldn't really come into my office put on my Oculus Rift and choose to play Kin, I'd want to do something a little bit more substantial than that. Whereas on the Oculus Go, that's the perfect platform for it. I can sit in the living room just for 10 minutes and play a few levels of Kin and, and then pop put the uh, Go back down again and there's no hassle at all. And it's these types of games that are going to win me over because uh, it's a shame Anthony's not on the show actually because you know he would often speak about Kin uh, Blaze Rush is another example. He he'd speak about that quite often. And although I really enjoyed both of these games, they were never games that I'd play. And now I'm going to. I know I'm going to play them um, in exactly the kind of scenarios that you've already 
described steve like going away on a trip <laughs> again i don't want to go on holiday and wear my go all the time but you know it's there as an option just for 10 minutes if you've got 10 minutes downtime it's always there as an option i think it'll be great um so it's these these games that are going to thrive and i've always felt like it's the games where the games and experiences are why i'm i'm going to use the go it's not necessarily the media com- consumption which it is for a lot of people and i can understand that um watching netflix for example is a very good experience and i will i will will acknowledge that but um a lot of this i like these short little games that i can jump in and out of and also the experiences as well um but yeah i know you you like the media aspect of it as well steve yeah i think that's where i'm going to use it the most i'm going to play the the really good games that that i can probably play with a gamepad um unless there's some good game that that really isn't I don't want to say hindered, but that plays really nice with the three DOF controller. Um, I think I'm going to play most games like like Ken, Blaze Rush. Um, there are a couple games I haven't gotten to. I've started Republic. Uh, I, I'm not really quite ready to talk about it because I'm still pretty early on. Uh, I think that I have well, I haven't played that with a gamepad yet, but that plays okay with the um, the Go controller. Uh, and then I have um, I forget they I just. We we just got they suspect nothing or something like that like oh I, yeah yeah um, yeah I think that's called that yeah, yeah I haven't I haven't really gotten into that and I have a few more games to get to um, but I think my biggest like the, you know if, if if I were like in Steam where you can see how many hours you spend in something I think Netflix and and just the um, the the media gallery the video gallery or whatever they call it yeah. like I think that's where I'm gonna have the most hours logged over the next say year or two years in the Oculus Go it's it's definitely gonna be in in the media and consumption because because it's just it's a very good video player which also kind of brings me back to that point of friction with with the vive and and um i guess windows mr as well uh it, it's there's a little more involved well windows mr is better I, I shouldn't say i shouldn't include them here but i remember with the vive like there was no good way to really get to a movie that there wasn't for the longest time maybe there you know there's a youtube app now but there wasn't like native apps to just go in and watch Netflix and so you had to have an app like big screen and then you had to set it up or um, it was a whirly gig and there's, there's several uh, apps that you can get for PC VR to explore video content but you had to launch that app and then when you're in that app you had to find the video off of your off of your uh, file explorer or whatever like with the Oculus Go, like I'm just in Netflix really quick. Like it, it's reduced the friction to watching video content, um, which was an issue I had with PC VR. Like, hey, I don't want to really want want to be tethered to this room uh, to watch video. I want to lay down in my bed, lay down on the couch, or you know, the proverbial airplane that a lot of people talk about. Um, I think most people, there's no way they fly as often as they insinuate. Um, but but you know, those are the scenarios where I want to watch video and. The Oculus Go does that better. It's not that it's just mobile. Like the mobile part's great, and you know, that's the, the most important piece. But even if the Oculus Go had a cable, and I could get in this room, you know, we could do time trials with me and and and, and a clone or another person. I could be in Netflix and have a video launched and playing on the Oculus Go quicker than I can on my Rift, and quicker than I could on my Vive, quicker than I can on my PlayStation VR. And there's something to that that intentional reduction of friction um, that Oculus has done here. Um, yeah, no, I, I do agree with that. And um, one thing I want to mention as well, because this is something I wasn't expecting, you can actually just directly stream from, if you've got a, like a home media server, a NAS driver, a media server, just stream straight into your uh, headset. And that works really well as well. And I wasn't expecting that. Um, but the other game I want to just speak very briefly on before we move on to news is um, End Space, because this is a game that I've played on the Rift. Um, I'm sure. Sh- is it Rift or was it old, older than that? I'm not too sure. It might have been on my Vive, whatever. But it's um, it's a game that came out, and I never really got into it. And I should have done, because it's not a bad game at all. But on the go, this works really, really well. I mean, I'm sitting there with this headset that I can just put on and 10 seconds later i'm in end space i'm i'm in a spaceship flying around um absolutely incredible and the graphics look great this is the thing that that blows my mind on this how good some of the graphics do look and how well the frame rate works and there is this thing you know a lot of them will run at 60 hertz and there is a little bit of flicker which you can sort of um remove very slightly by uh, dimming the screen down but there is still a little bit of flicker but it's not really that distracting if you look for it you can see it but when you're in play in a game it's not really too bad um 
there have been a couple of examples with games where there have been like small uh, frame dips now and again that I've noticed. Nothing really to to make a difference to your experience, and it blows my mind how they've they've done this. Really, this product is fantastic, um, and I actually I think standalone VR is going to be far bigger than anything else and and it makes me far more excited for the santa cruz because just to get something like this where you do have six degrees of freedom with six degrees of freedom controllers so easy so simple to just put on press a button and you're there there's nothing else to do and as you say steve we, we're sort of well i guess I'm, I'm sort of repeating myself and repeating your points it's the the frictionless aspect of the oculus go well, yeah, yeah. About that, no, Chris, we've been talking. I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> I was just gonna say, like, compared to Gear VR, it, it had some of like a lot of that friction was putting the phone in and out, which sucked. Um, and then every time I'd want to do it, it'd be like you have a software update and then I'd have to take it out, and then you have to like update the Oculus app, and it was really annoying. So it's good to hear that they always are trying to cut down on that. I was also gonna say, you guys really should like try Dead and Buried because I want to see what that's like because I know there's a go version and there's also the pc version that's pretty good so yeah yeah i'm gonna give i'm gonna give that one a go um crap i forgot where i was going with my with my thought before um well let's just move on or, or we got anything else to say is i don't know what i was gonna say no i think that's okay we can we can we can move on because um you know the go is a few weeks old now and uh, people have been talking about it for a long time i've not really got anything else to add on top of that i just think it's a great device um, and i do highly recommend it even if you've got a, a pc or psvr kind of uh, vr headset so yeah uh, i think great... you convinced me to get one <laughs> <laughs> finally it's a great augment right like um i do remember what i was going to say gary i know you were very very interested in the L lenovo mirage yeah and yeah having experienced the oculus go now and i know you haven't um experienced the mirage um but but knowing what that cost is and and knowing that that what you gain is the six degree of freedom in the headset itself as well as um a different content library uh what are your thoughts now would you have been sick for me i guess I'll, I'll stack your my question to you with with a comment in that for me i'm still not quite sold on say the santa cruz or or these more expensive uh standalone headsets because I'm, I'm worried about graphical fidelity um yes i think the santa cruz will get six degree of freedom and everything they'll get that all working really well but i i still am concerned that i can't play a game like say skyrim or whatever on a santa mm -hmm. cruz so that that gives me a lot of pause um where do you think you you will fit if you know would you have I guess I don't feel like I have any sort of buyer's remorse or anything with the Oculus Go because it was so cheap. If I had this exact same experience, as much as I like it, but it costs $500, I think I would have buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. Where do, where do you sit with that? Um, you know, just in relation to the Lenovo Mirage, but also in concepts of the Santa Cruz, you know, would you like to have these Go-like experiences, but with six degrees of freedom? Is that worth the the six hundred dollars seven hundred dollars or whatever a santa cruz may go for yeah that's interesting and and well just to bring it back to the lenovo mirror solo because i pre-ordered that i i, I pre-ordered it only the day before it actually went on sale um and i didn't get a shipping notification um or anything like that and i've you know it, it was a long time i waited for a long time and they gave me no indication of when i was going to get one um it was sold out everywhere i don't think they made very many of them but but your point there of what you were saying about the, the content in terms of these six degrees of freedoms headsets. So, for example, the Lenovo Mirage Solo, it uses the Daydream uh, content library. Now, that's all been designed around three degrees of freedom in mind. Is it really worth picking up the Len Lenovo if... The, all of these these games have been made with three degrees of freedom anyway you've got this option and i guess occasionally even in the oculus go it would be nice like in games like kin just to lean in every now and again um to get a closer look at certain things but it's not really going to make or break the experience whereas and and this also goes for the, the santa cruz what you were alluding to there will the santa cruz have oculus go experiences um with just three degrees of freedom i think that, that, that there needs to be a separate content library and i think it goes back to what we don't know about the santa cruz will it have dumbed down or or toned down versions of rift games on the santa cruz or will it have six degree of freedom versions 
uh, of Oculus Go games. We don't know yet, and we don't know where that device is going to fit in. Um, it's an interesting point, but I am still actually, because part of this, the reason I, I pre-ordered the, the Mirage Solo was because I am just intrigued by Six Degrees of Freedom in a standalone headset. Really, I knew deep down I would get far more use out of an Oculus Go because of the large content library. Um, and I knew I would I would use it far more, but I was still intrigued enough to go for the Lenovo um, just for the 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 reasons so i'm just this kind of person where sometimes i'll go for things that are not necessarily the best choice just because they have a, a slightly higher spec or a slightly higher uh, piece of tech in them just to give them a try you know even if i do have a little bit of remorse afterwards I mean, i'm just that kind of a person um but yeah i think you've raised a couple of interesting points there and i think all of these answers will come out over the next few months where will santa cruz fit in in, in terms of content um but also how well would the lenovo adapt because it's only a, it's it's one headset and it's not really going to get a great deal of support from developers that are going to be having six degrees of freedom content on the daydream library i wouldn't have thought anyway okay. um Okay, uh, well, we've got a couple of new stories that we can talk about this week. So I think that's pretty much all the games anyway. Uh, yeah, so let's get on to a few new stories that we can go through. So the first one, and we, we talk about... Um, AR headsets on this show quite a bit. It's called VR Roundtable, but for some reason we keep bringing these in here because it's interesting. To me personally, I'm really interested in AR, so I wanted to include this news story. Not a lot to say on this, but it's um, Google are reportedly working on a standalone AR headset, which I think most people would have assumed anyway, um, even though it hasn't been reported before. Um, now, this comes from a leaked document, and this is supposed to sort of rival something like the HoloLens, the Microsoft HoloLens, um, or at least the next version of the HoloLens, which is supposed to have a slightly higher field of view and these, these kinds of things. Um, so it's codenamed Google A65, and it still seems to be relatively early in development, if it's in development at all, um, because Google were rumored to be talking to various third parties, uh, manufacturers to to base products on a presumably a reference design for this. Um, but they were talking to them at the beginning of this year. So I don't think we're going to see a product sort of any time this year. It might be the earliest we hear of any anything of this um but all of these ar headsets i think it points to an ar future uh, chris what do you think yeah i mean it, i guess it must i just like the name of it i mean that's like all i can really get out of it so far there's no specs or anything but i mean if anything this just confirms that all these big companies are all working towards the same goal of having these ar headsets that people wear so i think that's exciting um but other than that, like we don't really know too much about it, but I'm, I am excited for this AR future because it's definitely happening. There's so much evidence for it now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, Steve. Um, uh, because we speak so often about AR on this on this show, and often whenever we speak about these products, you don't really have too much to say at the moment on AR. What, what do you think of this one in particular? Is there anything that's going to sway you now? Google are on board. <laughs> I'm not. I like. I don't. I, there's there's not really much to think about. You know, they're talking about a Qualcomm chip, a QSC six oh three four core. Okay. Like <laughs> you know, it's like cool. Like, you know, there's not much. You know, we don't we don't know what the product looks like. Um I think the one thing I, I may repeat saying is that it shows like um I'm I'm personally I'm a believer in AR. Like like I think that that, that has so much utility. Um, you know, not from a, a gaming or a media consumption standpoint, but it just has so much utility in the world. Um, smartphones have been so successful in the utility that they provide, you know, not only as a communication tool, but as a, um, a location, a mapping, a charting. Uh, you know, I, I, I hung these pictures and I, and I, and I bought the level out app out on my phone and, and it helped me level the pictures so when I hung them earlier this week like there's so much utility in a in a small computer that you can put in your pocket and and although AR is isn't that um it is in a way like the the, the same sort of uh, mental gymnastic to to kind of say that 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 the convenience made by a device that can layer uh virtual things in your field of view uh to help you to assist you with some task or some function um cooking like I, I could see myself wearing a 
a thing while I'm cooking spaghetti or something, and like you know, it, it it's telling me, okay, add the 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 marinara now, and it like and it highlights the marinara sitting on my counter, and you know somehow analyzes the volume as I'm putting it in to make sure I don't over sauce it or something. Like there's so much utility potential that could could occur one day from AR um, that I think it's a foregone conclusion in my mind that it's going to be a huge success. Uh, each individual player stepping into the ring, I would expect Google to be working. To, like to me, this isn't news. Like I expected Google to have be wor been working on an AR headset. Um, we should expect every major electronics company to be working on AR and VR headsets at this point, particularly AR headsets, because less is known in that space. And someone is going to want to get the jump on that market. Yeah. The, um, we've not got this in the in the news uh, list this week, but I did want to quickly mention it, just leading on from AR. It's this uh, Digilens, Upload VR reported on this, and this is Digilens, a company that raised $25 million for automotive holographic display, where basically it's a sat-nav through your window screen, and it, and it, it overlays arrows onto the road. I came up with this idea about 15 years ago. My dad, I'm going to get my dad on here because he can back me up on this. I, I came up with this idea and I, I presume I'm getting some kind of a share of this $25 million. Um, I guess it's coming my way at some point. Um, Did you file but, the yeah. paperwork? <laughs> <laughs> it's all about but the paperwork. I guess, I guess this idea is sort of obvious anyway, at least at this time. Um, but it looks pretty interesting. I'm sure this is the way it's going to be, you know, with this uh, sat nav stuff. You're going to have these arrows overlaid onto the road in front of you where you're driving. Um, and I think it would work great. I, th I, I You know, I, I drive a lot for, with my job. So I think this would be a, a great way of navigating the world, really. Yeah, I think this is a great idea. OK, um, on to the next one. So this is a Steam VR input. Um, this is a new little application that, you, that is part of the Steam VR beta, the latest branch of Steam VR beta that everybody can download and give a try to. So it works with all Steam VR compatible headsets um, with motion controllers where you can just uh, change bindings on the controllers. And what you're able to do, you can go into, it works on a per application basis. So you can select whichever game you want to uh, look at, and then you can change the controls for that specific application and save profiles and all this kind of stuff. Um, it also has the ability to, you, you can publish these bindings on Steam Workshop. So um, other people can download them. Um, if you've got a particular binding that works well for any particular game, then other people can download that as well. It's a great idea, and I guess it comes from um, OpenVR Advanced uh input settings is it is that what it's, uh the input emulator so um, no i don't think i think i remember seeing um reddit forums with uh the developer of open vr advanced settings uh, i think it's the same developer matt's man i think is his name uh or is his username on um on reddit um but he had been commenting um, in the last, it, this goes back to playing Fallout on Oculus Rift when I believe he last updated Input Emulator. He, he updated it for that, it, with that game in mind and had, had said something along the lines of, well, well Steam or Valve is working on a, a built-in tool into Steam VR to give this function. So it sounds to me like um, they have independently decided to go down this road that they're not necessarily using his code or that he isn't helping them. Um, but I'm, but I'm not hundred percent sure. And, and ultimately that doesn't really matter that much in the sense of, of, of the benefit here. Um, I was excited when I heard that we were getting official support for this, but now that, that uh, Fallout has gotten official Rift support from Bethesda, um, the value here is is less immediate for me. Uh, I think there may be an occasional moment where um, this will have tremendous value, particularly if, if games coming out in the future, uh, let's say Bethesda, um, they recently announced the, the follow-up Rage game, uh, uh, they haven't announced any VR support, but let's say they did, and let's say it came out of the gate with with only uh, Steam VR, Open VR support, uh, and Vive controllers. You know, this would be a great way to, you know, despite what the developers are doing, to to make games control better if you're on the Windows MR platform or on uh, the Oculus Rift platform. Um, the other thing I think that gives this immediate value is. Um, you know, if you have a worn Vive wand, maybe your touchpad isn't quite right, or maybe um, 
you know, you have small hands uh, or, or your kids can't quite do the grip buttons, you know, you can, can remap those to something else uh, to give you some, some utility. So I think it's a good OS level tool to have built into any uh, system. Uh, big kudos to Valve for, for doing this sorts of thing because um, I think even though I don't have an immediate need like I would have, uh, you know, in the in the middle of, of playing Fallout heavily, um, I think there will be future needs here, and I think there are needs for consumers now that that will get benefit out of this. Yeah, it's always good to have these options in there, and I'm glad they're still working on on these kinds of smaller things, I guess, but important to some people. Um, Chris, have you got any thoughts on on this now? Okay, uh, there's not a lot to say, I guess. Really, I it? somehow but found a lot to say. Come on, guys. <laughs> okay let's go on to a couple of little news stories we've got down here as well so the first one pimax again um some good news we've got some good news here so pimax are going to ship kickstarter headsets in june now that's the latest update from them and they're going to be actually releasing some pre-production headsets to a small number of people uh, this month so hopefully they'll get some feedback on there and just fine tune them and everybody that's back the kickstarter will get their headset or or begin to get headsets in june uh, next month so this is good news and i just hope that these things are really well received because if it is well received i you know i've got an inclination to possibly pick one of these things up once they've got them all out on the uh, kickstarter backers and um everybody's giving positive reviews on them then maybe who knows maybe i will pick one up steve what do you think I think you're not going to be able to pick one up if they're good, like for a really, really long time. I think it's going to take them a while to get through all the Kickstarter backers. Uh, and then you're going to be playing the uh, the game of trying to secure one on the open market. Um, so I think it may be hard to pick one up, but but I'm with you. I understand where, you're, where your thought is. Um, if this thing's a success, I want one. Like there's no question uh, about it. I, I was very close to, uh, well, I did formally back it, but then I removed my backing, whatever that's called. I backed out of the backing. Um, uh, so, but, but I, I remain very intrigued by the, by the Pimax headset and, and I do hope these units do go out here in June. Um, I hope Sweeviver gets one. I, I hope he made their very short list of the 10 or so people. I think that they're going to send the, the pre-production uh, units out to, uh, cause I know he'll run it through, uh, the paces and we'll all have a much better feeling on, on the Pimax. Um, you know, the, the people that, that hopefully, you know, give it a lot of notary, uh, give it a lot of focus. So, um, don't really have anything else. I'm, I'm still, Chris, I still remain skeptical. Yeah, yeah. I think it's probably good to have a little bit of skepticism on this product. But at the same time, um, it's, you mentioned Sweet Viva. He's tried it and he's, you know, an older version of it. And he's very, very uh, positive about this product. So hopefully it can live up to his expectations. Chris, if, if this um, device comes out and it's really, really well received and everybody's going crazy over it, do you think you'll be picking one up at some point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> he says with resignation <laughs> uh, i'm gonna be like wow probably shouldn't have done that but i have it um yeah i mean one of the other things in this article that i thought was interesting is that they said they have the 8k version stable at 80 uh frames a second whereas the 5k can reach 90 hertz so that's just kind of like a, a limitation they figured out right now but they're trying to get it up to 90 i guess before they release it but they think it might only be 80 but i yeah. don't think that matters too much um, but I'm yeah, I'm excited about it. I, I just want to try all these things. Why isn't there a place that we can try all, all these headsets out? You know, yeah, great. We'll be great. I think um, they, they've now settled on the 80 hertz. Um, I think they've said that's pretty much what they're going for. They're not going to try and increase it anymore. I think originally when, before the Kickstarter um, actually finished, they did um, say around that time, we're not getting 90 hertz out of their 8K headset. We can probably get up to around 85 hertz, but that's sort of the limit of what they, they think they, they could do. Um, but now they've sort of dropped back down to the 80 hertz. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. We'd have to try it to really see any difference. But even, you know, even on the Oculus Go, playing that at 60 hertz, it's not like a terrible experience or anything like that. So I don't think it's the end of the world. Yeah. No, but you're not moving. Like, I think if you're playing That's true. Red Matter and you're doing that float teleportation at 60 hertz, you may you may notice it a bit differently. Although I've played a lot of artificial locomotion games on the PlayStation yeah. VR that I know are running at 60 hertz reprojected. And... It's okay. I'm able to deal with it, but 
but also I guess I have very solid VR legs as much as I play. Uh, other people, other consumers may, may not get there. Uh, the 80 hertz limitation, the 5K being able to hit 90 hertz, um, I believe it's their upscaler. So the, the Pimax 5K isn't being upscaled. So they're, they're not battling that 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 scaler uh, and, and are able to get it to 90 hertz. Whereas the, the 8K, um, you know, they're, they're they take the lower res and then scale it to the to the two 4K screens, uh, and it's the scaler that seems to be giving them the bandwidth issues. Yeah, they have that and um, this brain warp as well, don't they? They they have that brain warp to sort of try and mitigate some of these problems that they have with um, the the frame rate. But um, I think that this 80 hertz because it's it's literally the, dis the displays as well. Um, they they are using these two 4K displays, and I think the displays themselves are only sort of capable of of stable refresh rates lower than 90 hertz um they should technically be able to get up to 90 hertz but this is where they're having the problems as well um, but yeah i you know if these come out and eventually we might get one or maybe we'll see some announcements for new headsets in the coming months who knows okay the last little news story that i just wanted to put in here is pixel ripped 1989 this is a game which i've heard a little bit about um so it seems to be like a, a game where you're you're sat in various locations, like a classroom or something like this, uh, set in the 80s, and you're playing a little Game Boy kind of device or Game Gear kind of device, and you're playing the game, but also things are going on in, in the world around you as well that you also need to take into account. Um, it seems like quite an interesting title. Unfortunately, it's been delayed um, a little bit. It was supposed to be coming out this month on Rift 5 and PSVR, um, but Arvor, the developer of Pixel Ripped, um, um, have said now it's being delayed it will be released this summer at some point so a little bit disappointing news because i know some people are really looking forward to this um but hopefully they can get it working really well um but yeah i just wanted to quickly mention that has anybody got anything else they wanted to add this week at all nope Okay, well, I guess that's pretty much it. It's, it's a slightly shorter show this week, but uh, I think that just reflects the amount of news that's coming out at the moment. With uh, It's a little bit of a quiet time, so hopefully over the next few weeks we'll get a bit more news. And also, again, I'll, I'll mention Budget Cuts again because I'm really excited about it. You know, that's going to be coming out in a couple of weeks and we'll be playing that as well. Um, but that has been VR Roundtable, episode 85. Thank you for joining us. Actually, before I go, I just want to thank uh, the reviewers um, that are placing reviews on itunes and all the other places we really do appreciate them we we read them all and it actually this is one of the main motivations for us to to keep doing this kind of stuff to keep getting together weekly and putting out these shows because anything any feedback we get even you know if you're a little bit critical of the show that's okay but we do really enjoy reading some of these reviews where people enjoy uh, listening to us um on their commute or anything like that it really makes a difference to us uh, so i can't stress that highly enough um it probably seems like we 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 sort of ignore all these reviews they just they they go on red but we read every single one and really appreciate every one that you do um for us so please continue to do that yep i'll second that like it's it's not just about you know reviews help you get more publicity like they, they help you push up and rankings and blah 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 uh to help your show get seen more and, and that's important uh but it, it is also a motivator for us like it feels good to see someone say things or to give us feedback on, on ways that we can can improve so it's it, the content of the review not just merely getting a review also matters and and while we're on the subject we re recently received a very good review i'm not going to read the review um but uh itunes user uh, cracked dish um gave us a very nice review very thoughtful review and I just want to, so they know that we saw it, because uh, we can't respond on the iTunes platform at all. To, you know, so we saw it, and, and thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so that was episode eighty-five of VR Roundtable. Thank you for watching, and uh, I guess we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye.